His Excellency, President Clinton of the United States of America, Honorable Prime Minister Sri Vajpayee, Mr. Speaker Sri Balajogi, Honorable Members of Parliament and distinguished guests. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you, Mr. President, to the Central Hall of our Parliament to address to address the members of both houses of our Supreme Legislature. We welcome you as an outstanding leader of your country and a world leader. Your term in office has witnessed a deepening of relations and intensification of contacts between our peoples, between the two governments and also the legislative branches. We note in particular that many members of the caucus in India, the first and the only country-specific caucus, and Indian Americans have accompanied you. We wish to extend a warm welcome to them along with other members of your delegation. This historic central hall of our parliament 50 years ago was a scene of an uplifting moment in the history of all democracies. The signing and the promulgation of the Indian constitution. In a magic moment, Indians like the American people over three centuries ago had become we the people, sovereign, independent, free, and the ultimate source of all democratic legitimacy. Ever since, Mr. President, we as a nation have been engaged in the momentous task of keeping the flame of democracy burning alongside galvanizing one-sixth of humanity on the path of sustained economic growth and prosperity. Often, the world stood by us in our struggles, but there were times when we had to touch a lonely path. In those moments, we derived strength from the spirit of our culture and civilization, epitomized in a famous Tagore poem in Bengali. Jadi tor dak sune keu na ase tabe ek la chalo re. If no one heeds your call, then walk alone. Mr. President, we have learned from Gandhi that it's better to be solitary in truth than be with many in untruth. The members assembled here today represent not only one billion Indians, but the many diversities of India. In our country, diversity is a reflection of a unique underlying unity. Often lost to superficial observers, this really explains why India endures. To us, Democracy is not just a form of government, but the basic condition of our very existence as a people. Eternal India will be eternally democratic. Our parliament has emerged as a powerful instrument of economic and social change, actively promoting a vibrant civic society. Human rights are preserved in India through the labors of a powerful judiciary supplemented by 2,000 years old informal institutions of our society. During your visits, you will surely notice the dynamism and the energy of this new India, coexisting with, with and supported by the old. The historic legacy of American War of Independence and the War of Unification, translated into your people's support for all national struggles for freedom. Indian freedom fighters fleeing colonial tyranny, found heaven and support in the American society. We fondly remember President Roosevelt's support to India's independence and your people's esteem for Mahatma Gandhi. I would like to use this opportunity, Mr. President, to thank you for signing into law the Act of Parliament authorizing the government of India to establish in Washington, D.C., on federal land, a memorial to Mahatma Gandhi. Today, at the beginning of a new century, 
India and the United States are poised to embark on a new partnership. The U.S. is already India's largest trading partner and foreign investor. Americans of Indian origin, first generation in immigrants, have contributed significantly to the advancement of the American economy, science and technology. It is our hope that this bond will be strengthened and despite periodic ebbs and tides will bring out our two people closer together. Mr. President, there is much hope and confidence that your visit to India will accelerate efforts towards a qualitatively new, forward-looking relationship, a relationship that will erase some negative memories of the past and let the collective energies of our people realize a new vision for the future. Gandhi made a perceptive comment on the enduring ties between the United States and India in a letter he wrote to President Franklin Roosevelt on 21st July 1942, which I quote, I'm quoting Gandhi, I have the privilege of having numerous friends there, both known and unknown. I know that several have taken shelter there. I have profited greatly from the writings of Thoreau and Emerson. I say this to tell you how much I am connected with your country." Unquote. It is this connection which both our countries must attempt to strengthen and enlarge. Honorable members, it is fitting that His Excellency President Clinton is here today to share with us his vision for a new partnership between our countries. I have the honor to invite him to address the members of the two houses of our parliament. Welcome, Mr. President. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, members of the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, I am privileged to speak to you and through you to the people of India. I am honored to be joined today by members of my cabinet and staff at the White House, and a very large representation of members of our United States Congress from both political parties. We are all honored to be here, and we thank you for your warm welcome. I would also like to thank the people of India for their kindness to my daughter and my mother-in-law, and on their previous trip to my wife and my daughter. I have looked forward to this day with great anticipation. This whole trip has meant a great deal to me, especially to this point, the opportunity I had to visit the Gandhi Memorial to express on behalf of all the people of the United States, our gratitude for the life, the work, the thought of Gandhi, without which the great civil rights revolution in the United States would never have succeeded on a peaceful plane. As Prime Minister Vajpayee has said, India and America are natural allies two nations conceived in liberty, each finding strength in its diversity, each seeing in the other a reflection of its own aspiration for a more humane and just world. A poet once said, the world's inhabitants can be divided into, and I quote, those that have seen the Taj Mahal and those that have not. Well, in a few hours, I will have a chance to cross over to the happier side of that divide. But I hope, in a larger sense, that my visit will help the American people to see the new India and to understand you better. And I hope 
that the visit will help India to understand America better, and that by listening to each other, we can build a true partnership of mutual respect and common endeavor. From a distance, India often appears as a kaleidoscope of competing, perhaps superficial images. Is it atomic weapons or ahimsa? A land struggling against poverty and inequality or the world's largest middle-class society? Is it still simmering with communal tensions or history's most successful melting pot? Is it Bollywood or Satyajit Ray, Sweta Chetty or Alaraka? Is it the handloom or the hyperlink? The truth is no single image can possibly do justice to your great nation. But beyond the complexities and the apparent contradictions, I believe India teaches us some very basic lessons. The first is about democracy. There are still those who deny that democracy is a universal aspiration who say it works only for people of a certain culture or a certain degree of economic development. India has been proving them wrong for 52 years now. Here is a country where more than 2 million people hold elected office and local government, a country that shows at every election that those who possess the least cherish their vote the most. Far from washing away the uniqueness of your culture, your democracy has brought out the richness of its tapestry and given you the knot that holds it together. A second lesson India teaches is about diversity. You have already heard remarks about that this morning. But around the world, there is a chorus of voices who say ethnic and religious diversity is a threat, who argue that the only way to keep different people from killing one another is to keep them as far apart as possible. But India has shown us a better way. For all the troubles you have seen, surely this subcontinent has seen more innocence hurt in the efforts to divide people by ethnicity and faith than by the efforts to bring them together in peace and harmony. Under trying circumstances, you have shown the world how to live with difference. You have shown that tolerance and mutual respect are in many ways the keys to our common survival. That is something the whole world needs to learn. A third lesson India teaches is about globalization and what may be the central debate of our time. Many people believe the forces of globalization are inherently divisive, that they can only widen the gap between rich and poor. That is a valid fear, but I believe wrong. As the distance between producers, large and small, and customers near and far becomes less relevant. Developing countries will have opportunities not only to succeed, but to lead in lifting more people out of poverty more quickly than at any time in human history. In the old economy, location was everything. In the new economy, information, education, and motivation are everything and India is proving it. You liberated your markets, and now you have one of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. At the rate of growth within your grasp, India's standard of living could rise by 500% in just 20 years. You embraced information technology, and now when Americans and other big software companies call for consumer and customer support, they're just as likely to find themselves talking to an expert in Bangalore as one in Seattle.
You decentralize authority, giving more individuals and communities the freedom to succeed. And that way, you affirm what every successful country is finding in its own way. Globalization does not favor nations with a licensing rise. It does favor nations with a panchayat rise. And the world has been beating a path to your door. In the new millennium, every great country must answer one overarching question. How shall we define our greatness? Every country, America included, is tempted to cling to yesterday's definition of economic and military might. But true leadership for the United States and India derives more from the power of our example and the potential of our people. I believe that the greatest of India's many gifts to the world is the example its people have set from midnight to millennium. Think of it. Virtually every challenge humanity knows can be found here in India. And every solution to every challenge can be found here as well. Confidence in democracy, tolerance for diversity, a willingness to embrace social change. That is why Americans admire India, why we welcome India's leadership in the region and the world, and why we want to take our partnership to a new level, to advance our common values and interests, and to resolve the differences that still remain. There were long periods when that would not have been possible. Though our democratic ideals gave us a starting point in common, and our dreams of peace in prosperity gave us a common destination, there was for too long too little common ground between East and West, North and South. Now, thankfully, the old barriers between nations and people, economies and cultures, are being replaced by vast networks of cooperation and commerce. With our open entrepreneurial societies, India and America are at the center of those networks. We must expand them and defeat the forces that threaten them. To succeed, I believe there are four large challenges India and the United States must meet together. Challenges that should define our partnership in the years ahead. The first of these challenges is to get our own economic relationship right. Americans have applauded your efforts to open your economy, your commitment to a new wave of economic reform, your determination to bring the fruits of growth to all your people. We are proud to support India's growth as your largest partner in trade and investment. And we want to see more Indians and more Americans benefit from our economic ties, especially in the cutting edge fields of information technology, biotechnology, and clean energy. The private sector will drive this progress, but our job as governments is to create the conditions that will allow them to succeed in doing so and to reduce the remaining impediments to trade and investment between us. Our second challenge is to sustain global economic growth in a way that lifts the lives of rich and poor alike, both across and within national borders. Part of the world today lives at the cutting edge of change, while a big part still exists at the bare edge of survival. Part of the world lives in the information age. Part of the world has not even reached the clean water age. And often, the two live side by side. It is unacceptable. It is intolerable. Thankfully, it is unnecessary. And it is far more than a regional crisis, whether around the corner or around the world. Abject poverty in this new economy is an affront to our common humanity and a threat to our common prosperity. The problem is truly immense 
as you know far better than I. But perhaps for the first time in all history, few would dispute that we know the solutions. We know we need to invest in education and literacy so that children can have soaring dreams and the tools to realize them. We know we need to make a special commitment in developing nations to the education of young girls as well as young boys. Everything we have learned about development tells us that when women have access to knowledge, to health, to economic opportunity, and to civil rights, children thrive, families succeed, and countries prosper. Here again, we see how a problem and its answers can be found side by side in India. For every economist who preaches the virtues of women's empowerment points at first to the achievements of India's state of Kerala. To, I knew there would be somebody here from Kerala who would want to. <laughs> Thank you. To promote development, we know we must conquer the diseases that kill people and progress. Last December, India immunized 140 million children against polio, the biggest public health effort in human history. I congratulate you on that. You should I have launched an initiative in the United States to speed the development of vaccines for malaria, tuberculosis, and AIDS, the biggest infectious killers of our time. This July, when our partners in the G8 meet in Japan, I will urge them to join us. But that is not enough, for at best, effective vaccines are years away. Especially for AIDS, we need a commitment today to prevention, and that means straight talk and an end to stigmatizing. As Prime Minister Vajpayee has said, no one should ever speak of AIDS as someone else's problem. This has long been a big problem for the United States. It is now a big problem for you. I promise you America's partnership in the continued struggle. To promote development, we know we must also stand with those struggling for human rights and freedom around the world and in the region. For as the economist Amartya Sen has said, no system of government has done a better job in easing human want and averting human catastrophes than democracy. I am proud America and India will stand together on the right side of history when we launch the Community of Democracies in Warsaw this summer. All these steps are essential to lifting people's lives. But there is yet another. With greater trade and the growth it brings, we can multiply the gains of education, better health, and democratic empowerment. That is why I hope we will work together to launch a new global trade round that will promote economic development for all. One of the benefits of the World Trade Organization is that it has given developing countries a bigger voice in global trade policy. Developing countries have used that voice to urge richer nations to open their markets further so that all can have a chance to grow. That is something the opponents of the WTO don't fully appreciate yet. We need to remind them that when Indians and Brazilians and Indonesians speak up for open trade, they are not speaking for some narrow corporate interest, but for a huge part of humanity that has no interest in being saved from development. Of course, trade should not be a race to the bottom in environmental and labor standards, but neither should fears about trade keep part of our global community forever at the bottom. Yet we must also remember that those who are concerned about the impact of globalization in terms of inequality and environmental degradation do speak for a large part of humanity. Those who believe that trade should contribute not just to the wealth, but also to the fairness of societies. Those who share Nehru's dream of a structure for living that fulfills our material needs 
and at the same time sustains our mind and spirit. We can advance these values without engaging in rich country protectionism. Indeed, to sustain a consensus for open trade, we must find a way to advance these values as well. That is my motivation and my only motivation in seeking a dialogue about the connections between labor, the environment, and trade in development. I would remind you, and I want to emphasize this, the United States has the most open markets of any wealthy country in the world. We have the largest trade deficit. We also have had a strong economy because we have welcomed the products and the services from the labor of people throughout the world. I am for an open global trading system, but we must do it in a way that advances the cause of social justice around the world. The third challenge we face is to see that the prosperity and growth of the information age require us to abandon some of the outdated truths of the industrial age. As the economy grows faster today, for example, when children are kept in school, not put to work. Think about the industries that are driving our growth today in India and in America. Just as oil enriched the nations who had it in the 20th century, clearly knowledge is doing the same for the nations who have it in the 21st century. The difference is knowledge can be tapped by all people everywhere, and it will never run out. We must also find ways to achieve robust growth while protecting the environment and reversing climate change. I'm convinced we can do that as well. We will see in the next few years, for example, automobiles that are three, four, perhaps five times as efficient as those being driven today. Soon scientists will make alternative sources of energy more widely available and more affordable. Just for example, before long, chemists almost certainly will unlock the block that will allow us to produce eight or nine gallons of fuel from biofuels, farm fuels, using only one gallon of gasoline. Indian scientists are at the forefront of this kind of research, pioneering the use of solar energy to power rural communities, developing electric cars for use in crowded cities, converting agricultural waste into electricity. If we can deepen our cooperation for clean energy, we will strengthen our economies, improve our people's health, and fight global warming. This should be a vital element of our new partnership. A fourth challenge we face is to protect the gains of democracy and development from the forces which threaten to undermine them. There is the danger of organized crime and drugs. There is the evil of trafficking in human beings, a modern form of slavery. And of course, there is the threat of terrorism. Both our nations know it all too well. Americans understood the pain and agony you went through during the Indian Airlines hijacking. And I saw that pain firsthand when I met with the parents and the widow of the young man who was killed on that airplane. We grieve with you for the Sikhs who were killed in Kashmir, and our heart goes out to their families. We will work with you to build a system of justice, to strengthen our cooperation against terror. We must never relax our vigilance or allow the perpetrators to intimidate us into retreating from our democratic ideals. Another danger we face is the spread of weapons of mass destruction to those who might have no reservations about using them. I still believe this is the greatest potential threat to the security we all face in the 21st century. 
It is why we must be vigilant in fighting the spread of chemical and biological weapons. And it is why we must both keep working closely to resolve our remaining differences on nuclear proliferation. I am aware that I speak to you on behalf of a nation that has possessed nuclear weapons for 55 years and more. But since 1988, the United States has dismantled more than 13,000 nuclear weapons. We have helped Russia to dismantle their nuclear weapons and to safeguard the material that remains. We have agreed to an outline of a treaty with Russia that will reduce our remaining nuclear arsenal by more than half. We are producing no more fissile material, developing no new land or submarine-based missiles, engaging in no new nuclear testing. From South America to South Africa, nations are forswearing these weapons, realizing that a nuclear future is not a more secure future. Most of the world is moving toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. That goal is not advanced if any country in any region it moves in the other direction. I say this with great respect. Only India can determine its own interests. Only India. <laughs> Only India can know if it truly is safer today than before the tests. Only India can determine <clears throat> if it will benefit from expanding its nuclear and missile capabilities if its neighbors respond by doing the same thing. Only India knows if it can afford a sustained investment in both conventional and nuclear forces while meeting its goals for human development. These are questions others may ask, but only you can answer. I can only speak to you as a friend about America's own experience during the Cold War. We were geographically distant from the Soviet Union. We were not engaged in direct armed combat. Through years of direct dialogue with our adversary, we each had a very good idea of the other's capabilities, doctrines, and intentions. We each spent billions of dollars on elaborate command and control systems for nuclear weapons are not cheap. And yet, in spite of all of this, and as I sometimes say jokingly, in spite of the fact that both sides had very good spies, and that was a good thing, in spite of all of this, we came far too close to nuclear war. We learned that deterrence alone cannot be relied on to prevent accident or miscalculation. And in a nuclear standoff, there is nothing more dangerous than believing there is no danger. I can also repeat what I said at the outset. India is a leader, a great nation, which by virtue of its size, its achievements, and its example, has the ability to shape the character of our time. For any of us to claim that mantle and assert that status is to accept first and foremost that our actions have consequences for others beyond our borders. Great nations with broad horizons must consider whether actions advance or hinder what Nehru called the larger cause of humanity. So India's nuclear policies inevitably have consequences beyond your borders. Eroding the barriers against the spread of nuclear weapons, discouraging nations that have chosen to forswear these weapons, encouraging others to keep their options open. But if India's nuclear test shook the world, India's leadership for nonproliferation can certainly move the world. India and the United States have reaffirmed our commitment to forego nuclear testing. And for that, I thank the Prime Minister, the government, and the people of India. But in our own self-interest, and I say this again, in our own self-interest, we can do more. I believe both nations should join the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, work to launch negotiations on a treaty to end the production 
of fissile materials for nuclear weapons, strengthen export controls, and India can pursue defense policies in keeping with its commitment not to seek a nuclear or missile arms race, which the Prime Minister has forcefully reaffirmed just in these last couple of days. Again, I do not presume to speak for you or to tell you what to decide. It is not my place. You are a great nation, and you must decide. But I ask you to continue our dialogue on these issues, and let us turn our dialogue into a genuine partnership against proliferation. If we make progress in narrowing our differences, we will be both more secure and our relationship can reach its full potential. I hope progress can also be made in overcoming the source of tension in this region, including the tensions between India and Pakistan. I share many of your government's concerns about the course Pakistan is taking, your disappointment that past overtures have not always met with success, your outrage over recent violence. I know it is difficult to be a democracy bordered by nations whose governments reject democracy. But I also believe I also believe India has a special opportunity as a democracy to show its neighbors that democracy is about dialogue. It does not have to be about friendship, but it is about building working relationships among people who differ. One of the wisest things anyone ever said to me is that you don't make peace with your friends. That is what the late Israeli Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin told me before he signed the Oslo Accords with the Palestinians with whom he had been fighting for decades. It is well to remember I remind myself of it all the time, even when I have arguments with members of the other party in my Congress. <laughs> we don't make this problem that can be achieved in any other way. In the end, for the sake of the innocents who always suffer the most, someone must end the contest of inflicting and absorbing pain. Let me also make clear, as I have repeatedly, I have certainly not come to South Asia to mediate the dispute over Kashmir. Only India and Pakistan can work out the problems between them. And I will say the same thing to General Musharraf in Islamabad. But if outsiders cannot resolve this problem, I hope you will create the opportunity to do it yourself calling on the support of others who can help where possible, as American diplomacy did in urging the Pakistanis to go back behind the line of control in the cargo crisis. In the meantime, I will continue to stress that this should be a time for restraint, for respect for the line of control, for renewed lines of communication. Addressing this challenge and all the others I mentioned will require us to be closer partners and better friends. And to remember that good friends out of respect are honest with one another. And even when they do not agree, they always try to find common ground. I have read that one of the unique qualities of Indian classical music is its elasticity. The composer lays down a foundation, a structure of melodic and rhythmic arrangements, but the player has to improvise within that structure to bring the raga to life. Our relationship is like that. The composers of our past have given us a foundation of shared democratic ideals. It is up to us to give life to those ideals in this time. The melodies do not have to be the same to be beautiful to both of us. But if we listen to each other and we strive to realize our vision together, 
we will write a symphony far greater than the sum of our individual notes. The key is to genuinely and respectfully listen to each other. If we do, Americans will better understand the scope of India's achievements and the dangers India still faces in this troubled part of the world. We will understand that India will not choose a particular course simply because others wish it to do so. It will choose only what it believes its interests clearly demand and what its people democratically embrace. If we listen to each other, I also believe Indians will understand better that America very much wants you to succeed. Time and again, <clears throat> time and again in my time as president, America has found that it is the weakness of great nations, not their strength, that threatens our vision for tomorrow. So we want India to be strong, to be secure, to be united, to be a force for a safer, more prosperous, more democratic world. Whatever we ask of you, we ask in that spirit alone. After too long a period of estrangement, India and the United States have learned that being natural allies is a wonderful thing, but it is not enough. Our task is to turn a common vision into common achievements so that partners in spirit can be partners in fact. We have already come a long way to this day of new beginnings, but we still have promises to keep, challenges to meet, and hopes to redeem. So let us seize this moment with humility in the fragile and fleeting nature of this life, but absolute confidence in the power of the human spirit. Let us seize it for India, for America, for all those with whom we share this small planet, and for all the children that together we can give such bright tomorrows. Thank you very much. संयुक्त राज्य अमेरिका के हिज एक्सीलेंसी यूएस प्रेसिडेंट मिस्टर क्लिंटन मिस्टर वाइस प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ इंडियन रिपब्लिक श्री कृष्णकांत जी लोकसभा स्पीकर मिस्टर बालयोगी एंड ऑल द ऑनरेबल मेंबर्स Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, thank you for a thought-provoking address. We are very grateful to you. Your remarks about democracy evoke many personal memories. It was more than 45 years ago 
that I first entered this parliament as a member of Lok Sabha. I sat in the opposition benches and saw the precepts and conventions of our great democracy being established under the guidance of our founding fathers. The traditions that our founding fathers established have served us well in these 50 years. As we have matured, so has our democracy. India is the oldest civilization in the world, but a young nation state. But democracy, rule of law, pluralism, and accommodation of the other point of view have struck such firm roots as to become unshakable. As a democracy, we know that we have to evolve continuously to keep our democratic practices responsible to the changing times. In fact, this too is rooted in Indian traditions. For centuries, our civilization has drawn strength from a pluralism that included adaptability and receptivity to new thinking, new concepts, new influences. Certain basic tenets, however, which are the core of the Indian ethos, remained intact through this process. Our freedom struggle was hinged on a robust national awakening and on democratic debate with the widest pos possible participation of our people. Our experience with colonialism rekindled even more forcefully our attachment to independence of judgment and autonomy of action, our opposition to systems and regimes that seek to perpetuate discrimination and inequality. For half a century, India has been consistent in the pursuit of international peace and legitimate security for all through global disarmament. We still remain committed to a world free of nuclear weapons and believe that this is the way to enhance global security. We, however, find that our environment continues to witness proliferation of nuclear weapons and missiles. Such proliferation continues with impunity. Our decision to maintain a minimum credible nuclear deterrent is prompted by a realistic assessment of our security compulsions even as we continue our traditional policies of acting with restraint and responsibility. Our defense posture has always been defensive in nature. We are aware of the importance that you attach, Mr. President, to the subject of non-proliferation. We believe that as democracies, we have to take all steps on the basis of wide consultation and cooperation. India has always tried to develop its relations with its neighbors in an atmosphere of mutual trust and on the basis of mutually advantageous initiatives. Recent developments have unfortunately eroded that relationship of trust with one of them. Our approach is realistic. We believe that mature nation states must seek durable and pragmatic solutions to differences only through peaceful bilateral dialogue. Aggressive use of force is no longer an acceptable language in international relations. Mr. President, as our dialogue intensifies, India and the United States must move beyond a mere intersection of interests to a focusing of our vision. The statement that we signed yesterday is the first step in this direction.
there is a vivid, vibrant example of the kind of relationship that should exist between us. Hundreds of thousands of Indians are today in the United States. Your country has given them the opportunity to realize their potential. In turn, they are contributing to progress in every sphere. That partnership is not contingent upon governments. It is a day-to-day -day working relationship and interbeing. It is one that enables both sides to benefit. It is also satisfying that our countries have started cooperation to address another vital aspect of international security. The problem of terrorism with its link to ideologies of extremism and funding through illegal trade in narcotics is one of the biggest challenges facing nation states today. We need to consider whether we are doing enough to strike at the root of this menace which breeds on hatred and violence and is the very antithesis of democracy. Mr. President, your visit marks the beginning of a new voyage in the new century by two countries which have all the potential to become natural allies. In this context, we can do no better than to recall to ourselves the stirring words of the great American poet Walt Whitman, noting that a passage to India is always passage to more than India. Whitman, in his long and admiring poem on India, called upon our two peoples to sail forth stir for the deep waters only, reckless or soul, exploring, I with thee and thou with me, for we are bound where Mariner has not yet dared to go. Mr. President, the, I would like to tell you the English version of this Hindi poem. For the deep waters only, reckless of soul, exploring, I with thee and thou with me, for we are bound where mariner has not yet dared to go. Shriman William Jefferson. Mr. William Jefferson Clinton, I conclude by extending on behalf of the people of India my best wishes to you and to the people of your great country. I do hope your visit to India will be a memorable one. We will always remember you and we are hopeful that you will always also remember us. Your Excellency, President of the United States of America, respected Vice President, Honorable Prime Minister, members of Parliament, dignities and friends. It is with great pleasure that I raise to thank you, Mr. President, for your thought-provoking address to this August House and for your ideas on the meaning and the significance of democracy. I am sure your visit to India and your address to the members of parliament would stand as a significant milestones in the history of our relations and in the elevating them 
to a higher plane of constructive cooperation. It is in this centre hall that your visitors from the White House, President Esne Or, and President Jimmy Carter have addressed our members and laid the foundation for Indo-American relations. Your presence here today will further strengthen that foundation. <laughs> Excellency, there are many connections that bind us. We are brought together by history, even if, even if geography seeks to keep us apart. Our historic nonviolent freedom struggle and the leaders who led it were considerably influenced by the ideals which influenced the American Revolution. The vision and wisdom of the founding fathers of your great republic were a tremendous source of inspiration in our struggle for freedom. Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation, drew as much from Henry David Thoreau as did Martin Luther King from the Mahatma. The simple words of Thomas Jefferson that all men are created equal and independent always create an emotive code in us. India is equally wedded to the spirit of freedom and dignity of the individual. We respect the great contributions made by American to the evolution of democracy and we have drawn inspiration from the American model. There is an impression among certain quarters, Mr. President, that we have implanted the Westminster system in Toto in independent India. In fact, the framers of our constitution have drawn from the best traditions of the American, British, Canadian, Irish, and other leading democracies. We have fine-tuned these principles so as to best suit our own needs. In the process, we have evolved our own convictions, which we are proud to say have enriched the discipline of parliamentary political system. This evolution is, however, an endless process. Our system continues to evolve to keep pace with the challenges of changing times. Your Excellency, President Lincoln's definition of democracy comes first to mind whenever we think of democracy. Like you, we also endeavor to live up to these ideals of democracy. If Lincoln's America stands as the largest presidential system of democracy, Nehru's India stands as the largest parliamentary democracy of the world. <laughs> Together, we can do a lot for strengthening the cause of freedom and the forces of democracy the world over. We must be engaged in a constructive dialogue for cooperative partnership to build a better world. Your Excellency, in this context, the developed world should join forces with the developing economies to make it, in your own words, not just a changing of the digits, but a true changing of the times, a gateway to greater peace, prosperity, and freedom. This, this thought finds an echo in one of the inscriptions engraved at the entrance to this historic center hall, which reads that one is mine and the other a stranger is the concept of little minds. But to the large hearted, the world itself, their family. In this context, your ob observation at the UN General Assembly last year assumes a great deal of significance when you told that you must refuse to accept a future in which one part of humanity lives on the cutting edge of a new economy while the other lives at the knife's edge of survival. We are also committed to your above perception. That is why we should engage ourselves in a cooperative endeavor for constructive partnership to herald an era in which our desire to create war realms 
our capacity to destroy and humanity finally lives up to its name. This long-awaited visit of Your Excellency has immense significance for relations between India and US as it gives an opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to goals worthy of two great nations such as ours. Your visit to Parliament House and the address to our members in this historic central hall is an important landmark in that affirmation. I once again thank you, Mr. President, and convey the good wishes of the people of India through their elected representatives in Parliament to the people of America through you. Thank you.